Hey folks, Malforn here, and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be covering the Dev Diary 2 population for Great Eminence. If you're unsure what this game is, it's a new grand strategy game, kind of built on almost like a Paradox Studio kind of grand strategy game. Uh, I did cover the first Dev Diary before, which kind of gives an overview of the game and what they're trying to do. So I'll leave a link to that in the description down below if you've, uh, you know, first time seeing this game and wondering exactly what it's all about. Now, today's Dev Diary is all about population systems in the game. So obviously, um, this game looks like it's data focused and things like that. So you know this is going to be entertaining and interesting as to, you know, what kind of mechanics they're going to have and, uh, you know, how they're going to model all these kind of systems. So yeah, we're just going to get to it. There's uh, some nice screenshots in here. There's some talking about how things work. I'm not going to go into the complex, you know, modeling of how they're going to do it. You can, uh, you know, read the dev diary yourself if you're interested in that kind of really data side of it. I'll leave a link to the uh, dev diary as well down below. And uh, yeah, we're just going to take a quick look and see what they're talking about. So at its core, Grey Eminence is a game about people, both collectively and in notable characters individually. So this is the first time I think they've announced it is mainly a, uh, a realm builder by the sounds of it, but also it looks like you are going to have some uh, maybe historical characters leading your realm. So I think maybe something like EU4 where you had like a king or a queen, but they were always just random people. Uh, I wonder if in this game you might have, you know, like you get to the 1900s, maybe you get like Churchill or someone in the game. I, I don't know, but uh, with them saying some notable characters, it sounds like they're going to have some historical people in there as well. Modeling their lives is the first step towards being able to simulate more complex phenomena. So we've tried to track as many demo demographic properties as possible. We've mentioned previously that each tile has its own population. Uh, yes, yeah, so they mentioned before in the last one, there's a million tiles basically, and uh, or hexes, and each one is basically a system on its own running all the kind of uh, modeling for that one zone and then they obviously they all talk to each other depending on how your realms are so this population is broken down into segments based on age social class culture religion and gender so a lot of information the order is important because we have a specific number of every possible combination of these parameters in, in essence each time is a database that contains the full information for this population so again uh, it looks like each tile is almost a game in itself and then they kind of interact with all the other tiles around them. So um, it's not like a, a macro. It's got the macro systems, but also every uh, tile is like a micro system as well. So here we go. Mongols. I mean, they know the memes. Uh, they, they, they've they put some Mongols on here for us straight away. This is a screenshot, obviously, of how a, uh, a county, I guess, or a hex tile. I'm not sure how they're breaking it down exactly. Uh, we'll just call them hexes for now, or tiles, depending on if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, this is uh, Shangdu province by the looks of it it looks like it's part of a duchy or something up there i'm not going to try to pronounce that name because i'll butcher it horrendously and uh yeah it looks like a pretty good ui already i mean this game is like a year away and uh you know i think the ui already looks pretty interesting a lot of information but also i think even looking at a glance now you can kind of see how uh, how the information shown in, in a pretty good way so it's got the uh, common cultural breakdown the mongol religious breakdown Looks like there's going to be some uh, nesting of tooltips as well, which is fantastic. And yeah, got garrison here. Uh, how good the defense is. I guess that's if you've got like a fort or something. Administration, that's probably how in control uh, of the tile you are. And then, yeah, the population breakdowns. There's 70,000 people here. Looks like, I don't know if this will change, but this looks like it's maybe a farming tile. Uh, yeah, between this picture and this one, kind of looks like maybe a farming kind of uh, tile. And then, yeah, the religion, social class, culture. Uh, if you played Victoria games, uh, this looks kind of like that. There's a lot of pie charts, which people like. And, um, yeah, it kind of breaks down a lot of information there. There's the nomads, peasants, commoners, slaves. I imagine it scrolls down and there's, you know, uh, the people in charge and stuff like that. So, yeah, it'd be kind of interesting. Oh, there's a little thing here, actually, that I missed. Chengdu was once a summoner capital of the of the Yun dynasty, the ruled China, built on the orders of Kublai Khan, the city is a meeting point between the steppe and middle kingdom for a time it was the largest city in the mongolic world but only decades later it would be put to the torch by the rising ming dynasty yet that need not be its fate so yeah they uh, they mentioned in the last one it's going to be like a historical title but also uh a historical as well you can kind of get up to whatever you want to in the game so i guess you can change history there and kind of uh, keep it as a, a good place to be, I guess. By precisely tracking each population segment, we can create a demographic model 
that can simulate the various processes that occur within a given population. So again, kind of like uh, that kind of micro of, uh, you know, this character is a commoner, but then the macro of like, this is the breakdown in the realm and things like that. So yeah, a lot of information. We'll, we'll see how it uh, how it turns out. The demographic model. Now there's a lot of uh, information in this bit. We'll just kind of read over it quickly. But, uh, you know, a lot of interesting information, especially this early in the dev diary. So, uh, children are the foundation upon which all populations rest, and as such, they are their own segment, unlike other segments. Children are not subdivided into culture, religion, or social class. Instead, when they grow up, they are proportionally assigned to the adult seg uh, segments present in the tile. Kind of makes sense. There's a lot of information going on. I don't think you probably know, like, oh, this two-year-old is uh, upper class and Protestant. You know, when they get to that age and they split out, probably makes sense. I imagine children don't interact that much with the with the game. They're just there to show kind of how your tile is growing. So yeah, understandable that, uh, you know, do you really need to know what a two-year-old uh, culture is? Probably not. These proportions can be skewed. Cultural discrimination and religious intolerance are but some of the factors that might compel parents to raise their children differently. You, the player, can apply pressure in the process through top-down innovation. Though its effectiveness depends on the country's bureaucratic capacity so yeah it seems like if you've got a lot of control over the country you can kind of try like sway people a certain way over time so you know maybe uh maybe you are someone that's protestant and you're catholic and you can kind of like over the years you know guide people to switch faith uh for their children every month a fraction of children will grow into be adults these working age people are the engine that drives the world of gray eminence and they are subdivided into social class culture religion and gender as mentioned before for most adults, the world of 1356 wasn't a great place to live, who'd have thought? Slavery and serfdom are commonplace, while nomadism uh, was the only way of life in many places across the globe. Economic, let alone political, self-determination was a reality for only tiny slither of the population. Basically, if you were like a lord, you, you had power and everyone else just do what you're told. Yet as the centuries roll by, some societies will tend towards emancipation, ultimately culminating in the modern concept of citizenship where social class uh, ceases to have a legal meaning so again you can kind of guide your realm to become a modern citizenship emancipation all that good stuff or i guess you can lock it all down <laughs> you know i'm the king you do what i say and you try keep that i imagine there's systems to try like force you to change uh, adults always belong to a certain culture and almost always profess a religion. Unlike children, adults are mostly set in their ways. They might renounce their faith under extreme conditions, but learning a new language and adopting foreign customs, something few can achieve. Lastly, we further subdivide adults into men and women due to the simple fact that only men, uh, only women can bear children, obviously. Kind of shows you can't just flip your realm into different religions and stuff like that. It's going to be one of those, you know, over time it happens. Not like play you for... You know, when the Protestant Reformation happens, you know, counties just go, oh, we're Protestant now. <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it kind of worked like that, I guess, in some ways. But uh, this sounds like it might be a little bit more realistic, kind of over time, you know, just press a button and somebody goes, you know, we're going to change this religion and then happy days. While the concept of retirement emerged towards the end of Graham Nance's timeline, we have nonetheless dedicated a segment to the elderly. Welfare became a key concern for states during the late 19th, 20th century, and an elderly segment helped us model the ramifications of adopting policies like pensions. So yeah, imagine they obviously don't put much input into your realm, but they obviously will use uh, resources and stuff like that. And then yeah, as you get later into modernity, you can decide whether you want to support them or more. And then yeah, nice little graph here of, uh, well, flowchart, I guess, that's what it really is, of how this is going to work. Peasants, commoners, nomads, slaves, all the, all the stuff that can happen to them and how they can move and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, by making Graham's population so granular, we can connect it to various other parts of the simulation. For example, we can link the number of children born per woman to local food availability. That's what I was saying before, like, I don't think you need to uh, mechanically show everything that a child does, but obviously you want to show how much food they're using and stuff like that, so you have to plan for it. We can tailor some diseases to disproportionately affect children, while others will affect only the elderly. By decoupling birth from death, we can accurately model population booms uh so again yeah it sounds pretty cool maybe there'll be events and stuff like that great harvest so your population booms for a little while or famines or something like that and it, and it goes down uh how can you as a player interact with this population as discussed previously our design philosophy favors top-down strategic decisions over micromanagement you can enact various policies from funding the emancipation of serfs to the amal <laughs> agglomeration of cities i don't know what that means <laughs> does that mean like they 
go together to force resettlement and mass expulsion. As usual, the effectiveness of such efforts depend on your bureaucratic capabilities or military. So I wonder if you can force them if you have an army that's good enough. Um, but in general, we against arbitrarily restricting player agency. So yeah, it sounds like you can kind of try to do what you want, depending on how your realm is set up. It's whether that's going to work or not, which is which is good. Population modeling. This is the last bit, so we're nearly done, guys. Not going to keep you that much longer. We promised. We'd add a section on how multiple the features are in each dev diary. So I won't go into this. You know, I'm not a massive... Uh, I play mods, but I don't like make mods or anything. So if you do and you're super interested, I'll leave a link to the uh, to the dev diary and you can read through it. I'll just show uh, they have this nice gif <laughs> of uh, how population works. So you know, commoners, male, what culture they are, what religion, how many of them there are. And it's just talking about how you can build through mods, you know, how this works and break it down. So, you know, like you don't see individual people here, their names or stuff like that, but you can kind of see a rough breakdown of, you know, their culture, their religion, how many of them are in an area, the male or female, all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, that's it for this dev diary. So again, guys, if, uh, if you're new to this game or you're new to the channel and you've enjoyed this episode, uh, if you leave a like or leave a comment, it lets me know that you're interested in me giving updates on the game. Like I say, it looks super interesting, kind of a new grand strategy. Uh, it'd be nice to have some competition for Paradox, uh, you know, because then everything just gets better if you have more competition. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. And uh, yeah, the Dev Diary 3 uh, Countries has already been released, so I'll be releasing that in the next couple of days. I'm just going to space these out a little bit, and then we'll be caught up to the latest Dev Diaries. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.